I'm going to introduce Gail, who is being generous of her time today. She's an author, a speaker, and a teacher. Um, and she's going to take us what I like her title. She calls it a book tour of her 14 um, published books over the years. She has racked up over 40 awards, uh, including the Moonbeam Gold Award in 2013 for her book titled When Hurricane Katrina Hit Home. She lives in Athens, Georgia. Again, Gail, if I'm wrong, it's from your website. Um, but she lives in Athens, Georgia with her university professor, husband, and three bossy cats. She has two grown up daughters and the cutest granddaughters on planet Earth. So Not bad. I cannot disagree with. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if anything, uh, if you want to add anything about yourself before uh, sharing the different books that you've written, um, feel free to. Okay. Well, if, if we're all here, let's get started. What I'd like to do is um, I'd like to suggest, let me, I'm going to go back to speaker view so I can see your faces as best I can. Um, I'd like to suggest that it's more fun for this to be informal, but I know that in a group like this, in a Zoom meeting, it's, it's a little more difficult to just jump in with a question because we end up talking over ourselves. So I think there's a chat on here. Do you all know how to use that? Yeah, so, and also we've been really good as well that people have muted themselves after they've asked questions. So it's been it, whichever way you'd like it to work, it's going to, it should work pretty well. Okay. So if you have a question and you don't want to jump in, you can put it on chat and I'll try to keep checking that. So the main thing that I like about doing these, and I'm so glad to be here and, and meet you all. My name is Gail Langer Karwaski and I went to school with Judy. Where's Judy? There's Judy. Okay. We went to high school together. Um, so, and we've only seen each other at high school sort of reunion events and only a few of them really, maybe two or three, um, because I have not been as good as Judy about coming back. Judy is a very organized person and she's organized many of our events. And so um, this is a treat for me because I get to meet you long distance. And I like to think of it as sort of sitting around in a parlor, although I know we're not really doing that, but. So I'd like to do it kind of informally. And I'd also like to take you on a little tour of my books, but I would also like to address what you're wondering about or thinking about. I, I know a lot of people our age are writing books or have written books or are thinking about writing books. Um, and so you may have some questions to me about writing, or you may have some questions about publishing books or books for kids. I bet a lot of you have grandchildren. How many of you have grandchildren? Raise your hand. All right, there you go. Um, so I wanted to kind of tell you about my journey, but I also, as a writer, but I also wanted to make it um, relevant to you. So if you have a question, I really want to answer that question. Do you know what I mean? So please don't feel like you're gonna be interrupting me or you're gonna stop the bus and then I won't know how to jump back on just feel comfortable like we're all together in a big room, I hope. Okay, so I was a school teacher and I was a person who loved to write and I still love to write. I love to tell stories. I tell my school kids when I visit in schools that um, being a writer is really cool because you basically get to tell lies, but instead of getting in trouble for it, you get credit for it. So, I mean, I've always loved to tell stories and I think to a certain extent, all of us love to tell stories. And the stories that I have told tend to be stories from history. That's partly just the way I got into writing. And they tend to be about American history and also about nature. And I tend to be a writer who writes not necessarily to reveal my inner secrets but maybe to conceal them to a certain extent. So I'm a curious person. And a lot of the things that I've been curious about and I've researched have become stories for me. Um, and so let me start introducing you to my stories and then you'll know more about what I've done and maybe that will stimulate you to ask some questions that you're curious about. The first book that I ever had published, can you hear me okay? Everybody nod if you can. You're good. Okay. Um, the first book that I ever had published was a book of short stories about Georgia. And 
I published it with, well, I wrote it with another um, writer whose name is Loretta Johnson Hammer. And the way this book started is that I was the teacher of Gifted Ed and Lori Hammer, Loretta Hammer, was a fourth grade teacher. And the year that we started writing this book, she sent her students to me during social studies. That's the way the school set it up. And at the end of the year, she was waiting to turn in her report card grades, but she needed a grade for her students from social studies, the students who came to me for gifted classes, and I hadn't delivered the grades. So she came to my room, and then as teachers do during post-planning, we got to talking, what are you doing this summer? And it turned out that both of us were thinking about the same thing, and that was that neither of us were from Georgia, she was from the Midwest, from Kansas, and I'm from Massachusetts, like Judy. And um, both of us were teaching fourth grade social studies, and that year, fourth grade social studies was Georgia's history. And we both had experienced a scarcity of decent information, decent books to share with the kids. So I had gone to the library and done a very illegal thing. I had copied books about Georgia's history, um, in desperation, I took them back to my room and I redacted them. I took a, a magic marker and marked through all the sentences that were too complicated or the information that was not at the level of the students to make a story that I could read to the kids about Georgia's history. And so Lori and I were talking during post-planning and I said, you know, I'm kind of thinking about writing the stories for the book that I wish I had to teach Georgia history. And Lori, who was teaching Georgia history in her classroom as well, I had her gifted students in mine, she had the regular students in hers, um, said, you know, I was thinking about doing the same thing. So we decided to do this together. And eventually this book got published by the largest publisher in the Southeast, which is Peachtree Publishers. And it's a collection of 12 stories from Georgia's history. What we tried to do was arrange the stories so no matter where you go or no matter where you live in Georgia, you're always close to a good story. And we tried to make the stories span Georgia's long history. Georgia was one of the original colonies and we wanted stories that represented various periods in Georgia's history. So we um, showed this book to three publishers miraculously one of the, well, all three of them actually were interested in it. We got two offers to publish it. This never happens, okay? So, I mean, I had been trying to get a children's book published for nine years already. And then I just kind of walked into this one, partly because the editor, the acquisitions editor at Peachtree Publishers who looked at the book um, had a wife who was a teacher and she had sung the same song to him that we were singing that you need a book that's relevant to kids about Georgia's history. And this is what we tried to write. And so he heard us say that and it immediately made sense because his wife was saying it too. So this book was published in 1996 and it began my journey as an author. After the, it, each of us, both Lori and I, wrote six stories for the book. And by the way, the book is now out of print actually, but not technically. So if you're into writing stories and public, you're trying to get something published, the publishing world is crazy, just absolutely mashugana, absolutely, okay? So let me just say that from the very beginning. So what I mean by the book is actually out of print, but not technically, is that the, the company, Peachtree Publishers, still owns the rights to the book. They are no longer printing the book, they no longer are warehousing the book. If you want copies of the book, you probably cannot get it from them unless they happen to get an odd return. But you could get it somewhere else online as a used book from a used bookseller. But they have not returned the rights to me and Lori to print the book ourselves. So what this means is they retain the rights. So if by some miracle in heaven, somebody wanted 40,000 copies of the book, Peachtree gets to sell it, not us. Do you understand? And it would have to be a lot of copies to make it worth it because one of our former students, now all grown up, actually wanted to give the book 
as the complimentary gift at her wedding. So she had a hundred wedding guests and we were both her teachers. She went to Lori for fourth grade. She went to me for gifted. And when she, and she was having a wedding in Georgia, primarily for out of town guests who lived in other places, out of town friends. And she thought, wouldn't it be cool to give the book about Georgia to these people coming to Georgia at my wedding? Wouldn't that be a cool takeaway gift? So she wanted a hundred copies. She contacted Peachtree. They said, sorry, we don't have a hundred copies. She contacted me. I said, I don't have a hundred copies either. You have to get them one at a time from used book, you know, sellers on the internet. Isn't that crazy? But a hundred copies were not enough to make Peachtree print it again. So like I say, the, the publishing business is absolutely mishugana. If you want to talk about that, we can do that in a while. Okay. So that was my first venture into publishing. Well, now, I have a question about that before you jump on. Sure. Um, you mentioned that two publishers wanted the rights to the book. Did you send it to multiple publishers? We sent it to three. And we got responses from all three. One of them was the University of Georgia Press, who said we were no, we're not doing children's books. One of them was um, the Institute of Government at the University of Georgia, but they were going to make it look like a supplementary textbook. And the third publisher that we sent to, which is Peachtree Publishers, which was going to make it look like a trade book, you know, like a book you would buy. So it wouldn't seem like a, a, a chore, an assignment. It would look like just a book that was fun, which we thought would be better for the book. So, but this never happens. I mean, nine years I tried to get published, you know, with various books. It never happens that you write to three publishers and two of them make an offer and the third says, sorry, but we can't. You know what I mean? This never right, right. happens. And, so, and was it ever part of school curriculum? I wrote these in the chat, yeah. but it's easier this way. Was it ever part of the school curriculum or? No, it was like a supplementary book that a lot of teachers had in their classroom and read stories, you know, to the kids out loud or let the kids borrow from their classroom library. I mean, it's a cool book. If, if I did it today, I would change a lot of things about it. And it's got hidden pictures of the stories inside all over the cover, which is kind of fun. Um, there's a story about Max, the first dog who ever learned how to parachute, who was at Fort Benning, Georgia, which is, by the way, probably going to be called something else pretty soon. So the book will, be, it will need to be updated. But you get the idea. There are, there are really cool stories in the book. We tried to make the characters sort of larger than life so kids would really be interested in them. It, I mean, it's a cool book, but that's the way it goes, okay? <laughs> so after this book, the, public, the um, editor at the Peachtree Publishers asked me from the stories that I'd written and the way I had handled animals, if I would be interested in writing a book about the dog who went with Lewis and Clark. So again, this is kind of an, an odd, like you wouldn't expect this in publishing, but the editor of the book, whose name was Sarah Smith, um, had, when she was a child, a Newfoundland dog. Well, as it so happens, Newfoundland was the breed of dog that went with Lewis and Clark. And she was very fond of her childhood dog and had read um, the very famous book about the Lewis and Clark expedition called Undaunted Courage and went to a talk in Atlanta with Stephen Ambrose who talked about many things about the expedition but during his talk the only question that he got was questions about the dog and it, apparently Ambrose said could somebody ask me something okay somebody tell me something that is not about Lewis and Clark's dog and, but nobody would ask a question about anything else. So Sarah invited me to write a book about Lewis and Clark's expedition for kids of this age group, basically this middle grades kids, kids in grades three through five that featured the dog. And that became my best-selling book, Seaman, The Dog Who Explored the West with Lewis and Clark, which is not written by the way in first person because I didn't want to trivialize the expedition. It's written in third person, but the dog is the main character. And so it's historical fiction based closely on what happened during the expedition. And I followed this book with two other books about American history that were published also by Peachtree. One of them is called Surviving Jamestown, The Adventures of Young Sam Collier, 
which is a historical fiction, a novel about the first successful English speaking colony in the United States in Jamestown, Virginia. Okay. And another one, which is my second best selling book of all times, which is called Quake Disaster in San Francisco, 1906, which is a book about the great disaster, the earthquake and subsequent fires that destroyed the city of San Francisco. Okay. And this is the book that has a Jewish main character, by the way. Okay. So after these three books, I did publish another book, or I did get published another novel, well, actually two, which is called Hurricane, When Hurricane Katrina Hit Home. And for this one, I went with another publishing company called The History Press, now called Arcadia, thinking, you know, maybe the grass is greener with another, pub, another company. And um, this book has not done all that well, which I think is partly because the company doesn't have enough clout to publicize it really well, and partly because it's got a really ugly cover, which we can talk about if you want to later. Okay. Um, and then I wanted to kind of diversify. So I also started sending in manuscripts, nonfiction manuscripts. These are for middle school students as well, maybe a little bit older, grades four through seven or eight. One of them is called Miracle, the True Story of the Wreck of the Sea Venture. And another is called Tsunami, the true story of an April Fool's Day disaster. Now these look shorter and easier because nonfiction for kids this age tends to be, but it's really pretty interesting and advanced material. And they're fun. I think these are fun to read. And one thing that's fun about nonfiction is you can kind of stop along the way and put in a box of interesting material that takes you out of the story. So for instance, the um, story about the wreck of the sea venture, which is the Jamestown colonists trying to stay alive. The King of England sent out some ships. They got into the perfect storm, ended up aground on some uninhabited islands we now know as Bermuda. So here's a box in the book about what is the Bermuda Triangle. So you can kind of stop the story for a while and explore some other ideas. Okay, and another thing that I really wanted to do because I was visiting a lot of schools and a lot of parents were paying for my books, but they were buying books for the youngest children, like kindergartners and first graders and second graders to encourage them to read. But I knew that by the time a second grader was old enough to read a novel like this, the kid would never remember having met the author. So I wanted to have a picture book so I could be what we call a full service author. When I spoke at schools, the kids from every grade would be able to connect with me. So I tried really hard and managed to get another company to publish my first picture book, Waterbeds Sleeping in the Ocean. And this is a bedtime story, but actually it's nonfiction. It's the true way that marine mammals are able to sleep in the ocean when they have to breathe air, just like we do. And I followed this up with riverbeds, sleeping in the world's rivers. So these are both nature oriented picture books. And Julie the Rock Count, about a little girl named Julie who finds a sparkly rock and then learns all about um, one of the most common minerals on earth, quartz. Okay. And then a little bit later, I came back and wrote my smallest book with a very good friend of mine it's called Thank You Trees. And this was a PJ Library selection. So technically I guess this is my best selling book, although I've made almost no money on it because PJ does a great job of negotiating contract. Anyway, this book has gone out like, well, Seaman and um, Quake have both sold over a hundred thousand copies, but this is my best selling book technically. Okay. Um, and. It, see the size of it. It's kind of funny. Of all of my books, this is the only one that got a New York Times book review. It's le less than a hundred words. Okay, so this is a board book for the youngest kid. It is, on Tu Bishvat, we plant a tree, baskets of fruit for you and me, orange, grapefruit, peach or plum, lemon, mango, apple. Yum. Okay, and then I, I also, by the way, have a novel on a Kindle. So that's my cheapest novel in terms of price. It's $2.99 and it's called Testing Ground. 
And it's about the desegregation period in Boston where I grew up. And finally, I, I've also done some work for hire books for kids, which I'm not gonna get into a lot now unless you're interested in questions. Um, those are books that don't pay me a royalty, which is a percentage of earning, but just pay a flat fee for the research. And then recently, well, fairly recently, I had my first book for adults published by the University of Minnesota Press. And it's a story, it's a memoir, really. I wrote the memoir for two friends of mine who were the world's first gay marriage. They managed to find a loophole in the law and got married in 1971, many years before gay marriage became legal in either Minnesota, which is where they live, or in the United States. Okay, so that's my journey, the basic story. Now I can elaborate on any part of it, but before I do, let me see if questions are coming in, okay? So, <laughs> thanks, Judy. My, I, I recently read, um, uh, one of my stories is a bedtime story and she was commenting on that. And that, by the way, has been taken down, um, it, which is a whole story under, under itself because the company that put it up there was afraid it was gonna um, offend the publishers because people could get the story for free, um, which is sort of ridiculous. But anyway, they, they agreed that we could do this and then they also agreed to take it down, which they've done, but COVID has not come down. Okay, so how did they find you? Did you send to multiple publishers? So that was the question I had asked you. Okay, um, so what you do with most publishing is you um, have a manuscript and you send it to publishers. Okay, nowadays, most people send it to many, many, many publishers. You look like in a bookstore or in a published book that you can get in a reference section on which publishers publish what. So for instance, the university, uh, well, no, that wouldn't be a good example. Peachtree publishes children's books. So if you have a memoir about your um, experience as an adult, they would not be interested. So it's a waste of time to send to them. So you get a list of the publishers you're interested in and you send to them. But increasingly nowadays, people go through literary agents, okay? So I did not go through literary agents on any of these books, but it, well, actually I went through a literary agent on this one. Um, but increasingly people go through literary agents. So they send their manuscripts to literary agents and ask for re representation is how you do it. Broker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the broker takes either 15 or 20% of what you make on a book. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's, it's sort of a silly process because it's very inefficient. So you, you look up to make your chances better what a particular li literary agent is interested in. Some of them, for instance, might represent people who write memoirs. A lot of older people like to write memoirs. Um, other literary agents may only be interested in representing people who write and, and illustrate sometimes picture books. Other literary agents may be interested in people who write novels. And so you target your literary agent and the way you find out what they're interested in is go to your reference room at your library or call your librarian during COVID um, and ask for the ref a reference book that will tell you which literary agents are interested in what, because this changes constantly, obviously. And so you wanna, you don't wanna buy that book, you wanna use it in the library. Are you with me? Yeah, that makes sense. You know, guide to literary agents would be what you would look it's for. It's almost like uh, the yellow pages for... Exactly. And most of them are updated every year. So that's how you would do it. So start with your local librarian's help rather than have me give you a title that may not be in your library. You, you know what right. I mean? Yeah, I get that. Um, um, the PJ library point that you made, because mm -hmm. I'm not sure if everyone, I mean, I know, well, my children receive PJ library books, um, but I'm not sure if everyone on knows about PJ library. So maybe you want to share about it. If not, I can fill in that blank. And then if you don't mind saying how many households receive that book. Well, the I'm first sending, uh, did you get this book where I'm your not kids sure. I'm, I'm going to ask my wife. I took a picture of it. Okay. Um, this went to zero, kids from, you know, the youngest to age two. 
They have yeah. they target books for different kids. So PJ Library is a wonderful program. It was started by a fellow and his wife in Massachusetts, Harold Grinspoon. Right. And it's a charity that was begun by Harold Grinspoon. And he's he made his fortune in real estate in Massachusetts, lives in Springfield. And um, he decided to begin a program that is similar to Dolly Parton's Make-A-Wish Library, in which he would send books to Jewish children. And this is done all over the country. It's usually done through a temple. And they target the books for kids of a certain age. Okay, so if you're if the kid that you're applying for is age six, they'll get books that are appropriate for kids of age six. This this was sent already twice, and each sending was over a hundred thousand households to people who had kids from the youngest, you know, just born up to two years old. And from many kids, the PJ Library program is free. The temple um, asks for donors who sponsor it so that the books go to the kids for free. But in some cases, parents buy into it. And you can recommend like you, your grandchild be included in a PJ library program. And it'll usually by, be by the temple nearest them. Grinspoon makes no um, secret of the reason that he did this program. And that was that he wanted to attract people back into Judaism, active Judaism. So. He is particularly interested in um, publishing books and sending books to mixed, you know, mixed religious households or households where people are maybe secular Jews and are not particularly active in their temple. He figures that this is a way to sort of bring those people back in because they're getting free books. They're learning about various things. Some of the books are serious. Some of them are silly. All of them have a, a very Jewish component. And the idea is that as the parents share the books with the kids, the parents will also be interested in becoming more active in Judaism. And I know that in my local temple, that my co-writer on this, Marilyn Gutman, started the PJ Library at the local temple. And she has brought in, they call her the Pied Piper at the temple. She has brought in countless families this way, getting active in in the temple, she's taught them classes on how to make challah. She's done all kinds of activities with them. And it's been a very effective vehicle in bringing young Jewish couples into the temple. We're in a community that's, that has the University of Georgia. So we tend to have a lot of people who are not all that interested perhaps in religion, but this has brought them back in a way to their roots, which is why Grinspoon wanted to do the program. So if you have a grandkid that might be interested, maybe you can go through Levi. Is that yeah, how you say your name? Or I go by all pronunciations. Okay. Um, but I do know that in Phoenix, because ours is through the Federation. So it's actually really easy to, if you go on their website, you can actually sign up your child or grandchild. I like that, um, to receive PJ Library books. And one of my other books, by the way, is also a PJ Library. It's called PJ Our Way when they get old enough to be real good readers themselves when they're reading novels. So um, this one, Quake, Disaster in San Francisco, 1906, also has a PJ Library edition. Let me actually, it, it, it's not worth grabbing it, but it looks, it's the same cover, but it, it looks slightly different. Grinspoon negotiates for the right to produce a cheaper edition of the book. And he buys it at a very, at a very low price from the publisher. So I get almost no money from PJ Library books that are my books, but they go on to a wide circulation, you know, because of the deal he made. So that's how he made his fortune in real estate. He's very good at making deals. <laughs> so um, let's see if you have another question for me up here. Judy has a question. And then I wrote down a couple that I can ask you afterwards. And I see someone unmuted a mic as well. She might have a question. Yeah, I had a question. Can I ask you? Oh, okay. Do you have a website if we were interested in any, buying any of the um, younger children's books? Or sure. how would we like, because I have a grandson who is be five and a little one, she's just turned two, but it, you know, she could grow into it and I could read it to them when I visit them. And yeah, you um, definitely want the, the youngest one to have thank you trees because it's so much yeah, fun. There, I don't know if she, brother is signed up for the PJ library. I don't know if my son signed her, but yeah, you I'm should ask. ask if they have that one. Yeah. 
here's my website. Let me write it down for you. Okay. So it's www dot and then my name, which I know is an issue because it's so long. But um, you can always, if you can remember a book title, you can look it up like on Amazon and, and get the spelling of my name. So it's www.gailkarwaski.com. Oh, wait, wait, I'm I'm writing it down. Gail, just a minute. I'm trying to get it. So it's G-A-I-L. Okay. A-A-R. W O S K I. Okay, dot com. Okay, and great. I think it, um, Levi, can you send them a yeah. link? Yeah, I actually put it in the chat and I will, on Friday's email, I'll include the link. Oh, thank you. Okay. So okay. that would make it easier for everybody. Yeah. And right. um, I think if you're buying books for little, little ones to be read aloud to, the one to start with, besides Thank You Trees, is this one, which is my favorite of my picture books. Yes, okay. Which is a very soothing bedtime story, but it's the real true way that marine mammals are able to sleep in the ocean. And um, so you can see it, it begins right here. It's night, little person, and you're tucked in your warm, dry bed. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to sleep in the deep, deep, see yeah, like and then it goes on to take you through a dozen marine mammals and in each one the little child is imagining what it would be like to sleep like an orca oh or i love that sleep do you do your like... own illustrations no so that's oh. a really good question and i am a painter i just enjoy painting oh, so much in my beautiful. dotage um yeah. but i have not illustrated any of my own books actually except for this one that I just did for a, a local group that is trying to clean up streams and rivers. And I did it as a picture book. Oh, okay. Oko, the superhero otter. So it's not a published book. It's something that they're going to put it in backpacks for children. Um, mm -hmm. So the illustrating children's books is a completely another number. There are a lot of people that both write and illustrate, but I'm not, I'm not a trained illustrator. So the publishers would rather would have rather have, at least back then, somebody oh. who was trained as an illustrator to do their own books. Oh, Does that make I sense? See. Yeah, I guess so. When you say trained, you're talking about somebody who has a degree or yes. I mean, how did yes. they yes? Yeah, in oh. art school. Right. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> but okay. in general publishers prefer somebody who is able to both write and illustrate. Oh. But if you are not a trained illustrator, I, I mean, you could submit some drawings and see if they'll take them. But if generally what their thought is that they're right. putting the biggest amount of money into the book. I mean, right. I'm putting the biggest amount of time, but they're putting the biggest amount of money because they're paying for the printing and the warehousing and stuff. So they want to put a trained illustrator together with a professional okay. author. I yes. get it. And okay. your book called Julia is called? Um, Julie the Rockhound. Rockhound. Okay. I, I wasn't sure. I thought you said house, but hound. Account, okay. Yeah. Which is sort of the nickname for people who likes, like to find Earth's treasures. Oh, okay. And what age is that for, do you think? About? This is... Um, the girl in it is written to be in third grade. Oh, okay. Julie is supposed to be in third grade. I mean, you would read read it to a kid so they could read it younger. But I would say anywhere from kindergarten to um, third grade. And the, I, the reason that she's written to be in third grade is, here's, a, uh, she's sort of at the margin. Let me see if I can show you. Um, is because that's the year that most schools teach earth science. So oh, it's sort of an introduction yes. to earth science. Yes, I understand. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And by the way, that Kindle book that's so cheap, that's $2.99 called Testing Ground, which is a great novel for people, particularly now with Black Lives Matter going on, um, that, that also has a Jewish character. And the Judaism does, well, not the Judaism so, so much as the Jewish culture plays some role because it's the story of two children who become best friends. The, the little girl from the Jewish home has lost her mom and her dad is grieving and upset. And suddenly his daughter becomes the mentor for the new kid in school 
who is the first black family ever to move into this white suburb. And so there's a lot of tension, like what's best for my daughter? I'm not comfortable with her being the only kid in school with a black best friend. And then on the other hand, the black family is very, very supportive and they're an incredible family. The, the father is a doctor and they're being beset by all kinds of racial incidents. Mm -hmm. But this would be for a much older kid, yeah. a kid in fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, who is trying to understand how yeah. this all happened. The, t the word test, the title testing ground is from what Martin Luther King said mm -hmm. to the people of Boston, that this should be a testing ground for housing desegregation. Well, th that's so it's right out of the civil rights movement, but not the typical civil rights movement that you always hear about in the South. This is the civil rights movement and as, as it manifested in the North, okay? That book would go very good in the school curriculum right now. Yeah, and, so, and yeah. You, you asked me, Levi, about some of my books. Some of my books have been used very frequently as classroom reads and supplements, particularly the novels Quake, and Surviving Jamestown and Seaman. So a lot of kids read these, like they'll have reading groups in school when they're studying explorers, for instance. Right. And the kids will read this in either in small groups, depending on their reading level, or and then discuss it in school. So not as a textbook, no, but as a supplementary book, yes. I have I have an eleven an almost eleven year old and a nine year old. So that's why Oh I'm yeah, they're perfect. So those are yeah. They're perfect um, for that age. You have a question in the chat from Judy, which was um, which book is your favorite and why? And then you were talking about the cover art. Um, the ugly cover. Um, it's hard for me to pick a favorite. Okay. And I tell this to kids at school, they ask me this all the time, because these books end up being my paper children. You know, I've spent literally years of my life with them, you know, and um, so I always tell the kids at school that just like my actual children, my two daughters, if you ask me which one is my favorite, you know, when I'm talking to kids at school, then it, my favorite is the book that I'm highlighting at that moment because I have the pleasure of sharing it with my readers. Yeah. But when, so if you were to say to me, which is your favorite kid, you know, like my real life kids, the walking, talking ones, I would say, well, it's the one who's not aggravating me at the moment. <laughs> yeah. And so then the kids always come back and say, well, what if they're both aggravating you? And then I say, well, then my favorite is the cat. <laughs> <laughs> so it's hard to pick a favorite. So I don't know, which one are we talking the most about? We're talking about Quake because of the Jewish character which has a funny story to it, by the way, um, then that would be my favorite for the moment. Um, the funny story is that I was in San Francisco on the anniversary of the quake. One year, some school actually brought me out there to spend the whole week with them as a writer in residence. It was a really special experience. And those kids found out that the year of the quake, Passover happened during, right after the quake. Who knew that? Because, you know, it, changes with the calendar. And so the kids actually asked me that question. And I said, you know, I don't know the answer. And they went on the internet as, as we were talking and found the answer. And I would have written that in the book if I had thought myself, you know, duh, to look it up, who thought of it. So I would have mentioned Passover in the book and I didn't because I didn't think of it. And so my, my, best, my best buddy, Marilyn Gutman, the one who I wrote the little board book with, who's the PJ Library Pied Piper, in Athens, she, I said, she was my, we, we joke, and she, I say, she's my rabbinical consultant on any Jewish characters in the book. I said, what's the matter with you? You didn't tell me. She said, I never thought of it either. So I'm still aggravating her about that. <laughs> now, you told me to talk about my ugly cover. Well, See, I used this new press thinking, you know, maybe the grass is greener with this new publisher. So I, it was History Press then, now it's History Dash Acadia Press. The presses are like amoebas, they, the publishing houses, they buy each other up. So that's why anything I tell you about publishing will change tomorrow, you know what I mean? So um, anyway, this is now History Press Dash Acadia Publishing. And they were looking, this was their first trade book, their first book they ever bought as a trade book to be out there for kids. And they were looking for a bargain with the illustrator. 
So they picked this illustrator and the illustrator made the world's ugliest cover for a book about New Orleans. And, you know, there's only so much you're allowed to say as the, as the writer about your cover. One of the things that they will never ask you was how do you like the art? The only oh. thing that they'll ever ask you is, is it accurate? So they, they might ask me, is his outfit historically accurate? But they don't want to know if I think the composition is good or not good, because what do I know? I'm just a, I'm just an average Joe. You know, I'm not a trained illustrator. Do you know what I mean? So they don't want me to tell them that I think the composition of this cover is terrible or wonderful. But and, and you don't have if you're the writer and they're choosing the illustrator for you, you don't have the control to say, oh. no, this illustrator stinks. But actually, this was the second illustrator on the book, and they still didn't get it right. The first illustrator had stuff on the cover, which I said, as a former teacher, you cannot put on this cover. The first illustrator had bottles of liquor and um, cigarette packs. They were like <laughs> emblems of New Orleans. And I said, are you kidding? Not a school in the United States will let this book be in your library if you have things like that for kids in grades four, five, or six, come on. So that they'd listen to because they weren't going to make as much money, they thought. So instead, they got this bargain illustrator. And now imagine that how this is going to do on the shelves of New Orleans, where everything is the color of king cakes, purple and orange and bright and beautiful beads and shiny. And you've got this, this cover that looks like it was made of mud. Yeah. Awful. But I'll tell you, it's a great story. The and this has a lot of Jewish content too. The story is about a boy, Chaz, who's just about to be bar mitzvahed when Hurricane Katrina hits. And his family ends up on the same roof as a family that they knew know through working, the family of Lyric. She's nine. She goes, it, she lives in the ninth ward, really poor part of New Orleans. He lives in the garden district, really wealthy part. They're stuck on the same roof with their families. She thinks he's a complete wuss when some kids from the street come by and start threatening the family, he wouldn't know what to do with himself. He can't handle himself in a street fight. He thinks she is like a complete baby. She's terrified of water. She's never had a swimming lesson. Well, of course not, because she's so poor. So they begin the story with their families on the roof and they, they are just like, eh, about the other child. By the end of the story, they have a lot of respect for each other. So they learn, she's the one who thinks when, she, when they go downstairs to get some stuff from the house before it gets flooded, she's the one who thinks about all the food and drink they need. She's practical, she's from a poor family. He's the one that figures out how to build a tent for shade out of the few materials they have on that roof. He is very smart and ingenious. By the end of the story, she comes to his bar mitzvah because you know she really remembers him as a great kid. Do you know what I mean? And that's the end of the story. So it's a story about the disaster and how it's based very carefully on all the interviews I did in New Orleans, but it's also a story about coming to respect other people for what they bring to the table. How did that um, be? I think that's the one that won the uh, Moonbeam Award. How, yeah. how does that work? Do you have to submit it? Does someone else have to submit it? Yeah, the publish if if it's a traditionally published book with a real publisher as opposed to publishing it yourself, then the publisher submits it for awards here, there, and everywhere, and all of the awards hopefully get the sales to go up. Okay. Does anybody? Are you? Let's see. The cover portrays the sadness. Yeah, but you know what's wrong with the cover is the kids aren't attractive enough. I mean, Chaz is this great kid can play musical instruments. He's really smart. You know, he's a terrific kid. He's got some problems. His mom is not a great mom. He ended up living with his grandma in the garden district. But, and she looks stupid, but she's not. She's this bright little, just clever little girl with all kinds of ideas. And, and so first of all, the kids don't look attractive. And then it also is too muddy. <laughs> just come on like make it you well, know make it look like it'll grab you off the shelves well, can i ask a question 
Sure. Um, um, you know, you said the first time they sent you that cover that you didn't like it and they listened to you. What, were they showing you the second cover, this cover? And well, before they, they showed me the second cover, but it's like a little tactful thing. The first thing they did was put me in touch with the illustrator because she was young and just out of school. And she sent me pictures. This book has, it alternates chapters, each of the child each of the children gets to tell part of the story. And before mm -hmm. each chapter, um, there's a little, it looks like a school um, picture, like a school photo in black and white of the kids. Yeah, so I here's the picture that. of Lyric. Right. And so the illustrator sent me those little thumbnail pictures right. and I, I, she wanted my, my opinion. And I said, well, I don't know that a boy who is 13 would, want to read this book based on what this kid looks like oh you did oh, you right. okay. yeah. yeah he just doesn't look all that like boys at 13 they want to look athletic they want to look cool and this kid really kind of doesn't and um the girl lyric looks even a little young for a nine-year-old to me she looks more like a seven-year-old or something so kids usually read up usually a nine-year-old will want to read about an 11-year-old or a 12-year-old i don't know that a girl, you know, of the appropriate age would want to read this or think this kid was just too young. So yeah. I said that to the illustrator and that was the last question she asked me about my opinions on the book. Oh. And then she showed, then the, the company showed me the cover and of course they were going to be enthusiastic because they had just paid for it. And they said, isn't oh. this a great cover? Oh, I see. Okay, I see and that. And I said, well, um, <laughs> and then it turned out that this character here that you can't see they had made him a her because they had the illustrator had not carefully read the book. Oh no. And I said, well, you know, the one part I could say is this is not accurate. So I said, yeah. you can't do that in the book. Right. This person is a her, is a him, right. not a her. Okay. Um, right. So they put the cap down so you can't see the person's head and hair. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, they, okay. I get, I see. All right. So, you know, you when you do have your book traditionally published, one of the things that happens is you lose control. So that's one reason that a lot of people prefer to self-publish. The, the downside is you don't have any promotional power when you self-publish. You've got to promote the whole thing yourself. Whereas when you use a publisher like Peachtree that does have some promotional clout, it has gotten into basically every every state in the United States and lots of school districts. So that helps you out, but then you lose control. Do you know I what see. I mean? Yes, so I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Ethel, did you have a question? I saw well, you unmuted your mic. That was my initial question. How much control do you have of your book once you send it into the publisher? I mean, the manuscript itself, do they... Yeah, they edit. And, ...and play with it a little bit and then... I, you answered the question about the illustrations. You didn't. You have no control over that, evidently. But how about the manuscript itself? Well, you do, you do have control, and how much control you have with a traditional publisher varies. Okay, so again, they feel like they're invest. You've invested all these hundreds of hours, but they are investing the actual cash that prints the book and warehouses the book and distributes the book. So they feel, like, and, and you know, they've got to also pay their editors and all that. So they feel like they've got a big investment and they don't want the book to flop. So they will give you a lot of suggestions on how to edit the book, you know, not, and we're not just talking like spelling and stuff. We're talking major edits. And some of their suggestions will be good and some not so good. And you can kind of, you have a back and forth with them. The more famous you are, the more your previous books have sold, the more power you have. For a first time author, how much power you have, it's a question of at any point, they could say, okay, we're sick of working with you. You know what I mean? They can break a contract. Contract. There are ways to do that too. So you have a sort of a back and forth knowing that you're on the low end of the power spectrum. But you're an artist in a way and they right. are manipulating your work, what your feelings right. are, your work. Right. So, but they're also supposedly more um, 
adept at knowing what a reader needs than you are because they're more experienced than you, especially for a first time writer. And so, yeah, you go back and forth and back and forth. Um, this book, I think, was really damaged by the editing. The story, um, it's a neat story, and it's based very closely on what actually happened. But when I was researching the book, um, the thought was that there was a friendly, friendly fire killed um, one of the characters, main characters in this story. So he was killed accidentally by his own people rather than being shot by the enemy at the time, the Native Americans. And I wrote that murder into the story and it made it a very intriguing story. And then more research came out as they were doing the archeology span for the Jamestown um, area. And it seemed like, no, it was probably not friendly fire that killed that person. So my editor wanted me to get rid of the murder mystery, which was really at the center of the book. And I said, but wait a minute, I'm writing historical fiction and we're still not sure what killed this character. And it makes the story much more interesting to have the murder. I think we should leave it in. And she said, no, I want to be able, our publishing house wants to be able to advertise it as historically accurate to the extent that we know. And they won. So I rewrote the whole center of the book without the murder mystery. I think it's not as interesting a story. So, you know, I, maybe I shouldn't have given up. Maybe I should have kept at it, but it's like, this was my second book ever to be published and they know more than I do. You, you know what I mean? Maybe I'm wrong. You know, you kind of start to doubt yourself. Now I'm really sorry because I think it would have been a better book. So, <laughs> And it could have been taken care of in the author's note. We could have just said in the author's note, now it's not clear whether it was a murder or not, which is an intriguing way to invite kids to research history. So I'm completely they're sorry also, I gave in, but I did. <laughs> they're also looking at the dollar, how many books they can sell or what is going to sell. Exactly. So not necessarily from an artistic point of view, but what is going to make money for them. Exactly. And, and legitimately so, because publishing houses have been hit very, very hard by, um, you know, the coming of electronic books. I mean, and the whole world of publishing is just reverberating all the time. So they have to stay alive, too. They have to pay to rent. They have to turn on the lights. And as we all know, in this frightening economy right now, we all have to think about that. So, you know, we tend to think of a book as being a sacred object, particularly people in the Jewish culture, I think, believe that. Um, and it, it's not just a product. It's not like hairspray. This is more than just something that sits on a shelf and makes people money. You tend to think of a book that way. I know I do. But actually, a book is a product. And it, it also has to make money in order for the business to survive. So there's that to consider as well. And that, of course, is what they have to consider if they're going to keep their jobs as editors and publicists and so on. So I have a few questions. One that was sent to me privately, and I think it connects to something else you mentioned. Um, so you mentioned that, first of all, you lose the rights to a degree that's on publishing or printing, but do you also lose the rights in the sense, can they modify your content to suit the times if they do a reprint or they would have to get your permission? They, they would come back and forth with you. And you, know, doesn't you, you would give them your permission. Whenever there's any kind of change like that, they would consult with you. And I don't want to portray publishing houses and editors as monsters. They're not. I mean, for the most part, they're in the business because they think as highly of books as we do. And they're very proud to be in the business of disseminating information. And they're particularly proud to be disseminating information to children because of course children have a special role in all of our lives. They're our future. And so they want a book to be good. They want it to be um, heartwarming. They want it to inspire a child. They want all those things just like we do. So I don't mean to make right. them the villains but there is a back and forth going on between an author and a publisher for sure. So last question, I think you mentioned this also in the beginning about the uh, book about Georgia's history. Mm -hmm. um, 
Does do any of these publishers do the print on demand model that some of these self publishing authors use through Amazon? Yeah, they do. It, particularly the teeny teeny little ones. Like there's a teeny one that a friend of mine publishes with called Black Rose, and they actually print in teeny teeny little batches, like less than a hundred books at a time. Whereas when you get a bigger publisher like Peachtree or one of the ones you think of from New York, they print in bigger batches, which makes the book much cheaper, which makes the economic, you know, the economical situation but I mean, like, much better. Like this, it would be such a, it would be great for authors like yourself, um, where they've run out of their original batch, say, okay, we can do a print on demand. It's going to raise the price. I'm assuming they could renegotiate a Roy. I don't know how that works, but. Yeah, they, was, they don't they don't ask us about the prices. They set them themselves. Oh, they set them themselves. Now, if you self-publish, then you set your own price. And for the most part, self-published books cost more because you print them in smaller batches and therefore they cost you more. So the author gets all the money from so if a self-published book costs you, like when you go to a local festival and you buy a book from an author that's been self-published, and let's say the book costs, say, $20, the author is probably getting all the money from the sale of the book. And so the author has paid to self-publish, usually with a very small company that does that kind of thing. The author may have paid 11 or $12 for each book, and then he or she will turn around and sell them for, say, 20 so that gives $8 profit, and all $8 goes to the author when you buy it at that festival, except, of course, he or she has expenses setting up the table and whatever. Right, um, right. If you buy this book in your local Barnes & Noble, the book's retail price listed, this is the paperback of Seaman. Let's say you buy the paperback in your Barnes & Noble, its retail price is $8.95. On Amazon, it will be less. How much do I get? I get about 40 cents on this when you buy it firsthand from Amazon or from, or from your indie bookseller. So I get a percentage of what the publisher gets. And the publisher generally gets half of the retail price. So the publisher is getting 450, and I generally get between seven and 10 percent of 450. So I get about 41 cents per book. How much do I get for a picture book? <clears throat> Since I did not illustrate it myself, I get um, between I split the seven to 10 percent of the publisher's amount with the illustrator. So wow. if you buy this book full price, at Barnes and Noble, I will get about 20 cents. So it's now, a numbers game. But do they sign you up? Meaning is there a, an original sign up uh, payment that they've taken you as a client? Yeah, that's called an advance. It's technical name is an advance against royalties. So you get, and a lot of companies no longer pay advances because it's part of the publishing industry not having a whole lot of cash flow, so they don't want to pay the money out. But the idea of an advance is it's to keep you eating until you can produce your next book or until your book can earn some money. So um, the advance is a certain amount of money. It'll be between, for a children's book author, it'll normally be between, say, 2000 and 10000 okay? And you don't get any more money from the book. You don't get any royalties, any percentages from sales until the advance money has run, has, has already sold through. So if, if I get, say, an advance of $3,000 on this book, that's all I get until enough copies have sold so that my 21 cents per book adds up to that 3000 Are you with me? Yeah. And then they, there are all kinds of other complicated parts of the... Um, selling like this one was sold with this special agreement with pj library before the book was ever illustrated um pj library had already started making deals with them so they made a deal with learner that the book would be a pj library book but they printed a cheaper edition that is not quite as sturdy as the actual trade edition so it can't get chewed as often by your toddler um but anyway but when pj library 
Roxbury negotiated this, they negotiated the special advance because they knew that they were going to be sending to 124,000 families. So the publisher really wanted the book. So the, the publisher basically made the book available to PJ Library for free, which meant that out of that 124,000 copies that went to PJ Library, I think, and, and I was splitting this with Marilyn as the writer, and then we were splitting it with the illustrator. Um, so it was a, a split. So I got 25%, Marilyn got 25% of this teeny amount of money, and the illustrator got 50%. The book sells for six bucks. I mean, you do the math. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of money there. On my very first check um, of royalties, I believe we got $10 and something cents per person. Okay. Wow. So it, it's not a get rich quick, quick scheme as, you know, as I'm sure you knew. <laughs> right, it's interesting. Yeah, it is. It, it's the whole thing is interesting and it's sort of something that you never really hear about because you hear about the rock stars you know you hear about Michelle Obama is writing a book well you know she gets considerably more than I get obviously so celebrity books bring in a lot more money obviously so wow I see that Mary uh did you have a question you unmuted your yeah. mic I, I want to know why, what does, it, what advantage does Peachtree get by sitting on your rights and not releasing them to you? Well, if you were to decide tomorrow that this book was really important for whatever's going on, the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, the pandemic, suddenly everybody in the country needs to read this book and they think that they're, you know, from their sources, that they're going to be able to sell 50,000 copies. They own the rights to those 50,000 copies, not me. So the, the whole, but if I buy the rights, and it would be complicated anyway, because I'd have to do it with Lori, and the illustrator who did the book is now dead, so we'd probably have to bring it out with another illustrator. But it, so it would be complicated anyway. But saying that we did it, um, it would be, all the money would go to us because it would sudden, suddenly be a self-published book. Do you understand? Right. right. I mean, it's not likely to happen. Obviously, this is not a book about coronavirus or whatever the current topic is, but saying it was... Not 1984, like George Orwell's... Uh... <laughs> right, exactly. Or pandemic outbreak, whatever it is. <laughs> Does anybody else... Let me see... Um, are golden books still around? Yes, they are, by the way. You, so, who Sheldon asked me, are golden books still around? And yes, golden books from our childhood are still around. If, But I don't want to take the time out. I'd run in and bring you a stack of them that I use to um, FaceTime with my grandkids and read them aloud over the phone. And it's so funny to see the prices of them because they were the, I have golden books that sold for 45 cents. And now that same golden book is selling for five, six, seven dollars. <laughs> wow. So that's kind of funny to see that. Yeah. <laughs> so that means that their publisher retained the rights and just adjusted it to the modern day pricing. Yes, exactly. As they brought out a new book. And, it, you know, a lot of them are books like um, the little, what is it? The pokey little puppy. Remember the pokey little puppy and um, the hungry little kitty. Um, anyway, so a lot of those books, the author and the illustrator are long gone, although they may have estates that are still pulling in money royalties, um, depending on how they negotiated all that way back. Um, but they have a vintage feel to them, both the illustrations and the story. And so young parents remember being read these books when they were kids. And so a lot of times they buy those books because they want to share what they remember from their childhood with their own children. So your own grandchildren are reading those books and there's a nostalgia kind of um, appeal to them. Our, kind of our, fun. our kids are in their 40s and I remember we, my wife used to read them all the time to the kids. And all my cousins and neighbors, all the kids had golden books. Mm -hmm. And that, that's where they learned, they started to enjoy reading Sure. From golden books. Oh, there you go. You've got golden books right in front of you, Judy. She brought them Both to show some of those books. Lift up the books so we could all see it. I probably have more, but I just quickly grabbed this. Oh, such baggy, fun. baggy elephant. Such fond memories. 
Oh, Bambi. Yeah. yeah. The pokey little puppy. I just mentioned that one. Is this hilarious or what? I bet. Um, oh, I've got a lot of stuff from years ago, <laughs> including yeah. me. And by the way, Gail used to have a Boston accent like me. <laughs> a little, too much time in Atlanta. That's right. I, so how did, how did a nice Jewish girl end up in Atlanta? <laughs> well, my actually, we're in Athens, right outside of Athens, where the University of Georgia is. And my husband, Chester, retired from being a professor at the University of Georgia. So he taught... Um, well, he's a specialist in how the cells in the eyes relate to light, and he started the neuroscience program at the University of Georgia. Oh, wow. Is he so we moved uh, here, when, and he became a postdoc, and then we never left. That's pretty fascinating. Yeah. Oh, the Tawny Scrum. I remember that one. I have that one, too. <laughs> it, it wasn't a golden book, but I remember the uh, I got uh, Little Miss Messy. There was a whole series of Little Miss. You remember that one? Yeah, yeah. Whoop. The monster at the end. Yeah, you remember these? These are hilarious. These are like now collector's items, practically. Well, are they? <laughs> yeah. And Maybe that's why he has it. Even the illustrations have a sort of a nostalgia to them because they're not really how illustrations tend to look today. You know, they, they tend to be more, I don't know, arty or unusual. This one yeah. has a price on it, 69 cents. Isn't that amazing? Oh, do you remember this? Oh, this one's 89. I think that one was on sale. <laughs> Scuffy, yes, I remember Scuffy the tugboat. Bugs Bunny, oh gosh, yeah. Isn't that funny? That's wonderful. So I think, um, Gail, I sent you a couple of private messages because uh -huh. I didn't want to put you on the spot. Oh, you can put me on the spot. I don't mind. You asked She's about really minerals. She's really a terrific artist. I, I don't know if you could. This um, book is was actually my easiest book to research because my husband is a gem. gem he's a rock hound. Now, he taught neuroscience at the university, but when he retired, you know, a lot of people, when they retire, they buy themselves a beach house. My husband, when he retired, he bought himself a quartz mine. He loves rocks and gems and minerals. And now we have a cottage industry where we go to, like, shows and we exhibit at a booth, like at a arts festival or at a rock show, his, his gems and minerals and fossils that he collects. And I sell my books. And so this book was the easiest book to research because all I needed to do was go down in the basement. So <laughs> free, free research, free research. That's right. And let me see if anybody asked me anything I didn't say. Wanted to know if you could show us any of your paintings. You know, I could if I was smart enough, but I'm not sure. Let me see if I can real quickly do that. And then I know you need to go because I've kept you too long. Well, first of all, we appreciate this entire presentation. I know that uh, for 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 myself, for my children, and for others, for grandchildren, just in general, it's a fascinating industry. Um, yeah. To, to this place. I don't, I'm not sure. Sometimes I'm able to figure out how to share, but sometimes I'm not. So my, you're sharing now. My, first, you find your pictures and then share, because right now we do see your screen. Let's see if I can find them and see if I can do And Mayim Bialik gave a um, little couple of Zooms on neuroscience. It was pretty interesting. Oh, I bet that was. Yeah. Here's, let's see if I can find the album. Rabbi, you weren't there. able to get her to, to do a Zoom, were you? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> can you see any of the, can yeah. you see, yeah, can see everything? Yeah. You can see them? Yeah, yeah, so if you just click on it, it'll go full screen probably or larger. Oh, the, I All right, let me click, my face. click on a couple. Yeah, I like the Mastodon. That's so beautiful. The, all, this, all of these are your paintings? Wow. And yeah, what medium do you paintings. work? What medium do um, you use? If this one is an acrylic. That's an acrylic. Um, that's an acrylic. I do watercolor as well. There's the massive. That's... um. 
that's acrylic. And you can tell, you know, my husband is into fossils. So, he, so I was doing mammoths, woolly mammoths. I actually did one woolly mammoth that I made with cat fur. So it, it had texture. Wow. wow. Is he um, into beach glass at all? Or are you? Say it again. Are you or, or your husband into beach glass? I used to collect it when I was a kid. That's yeah. one of my newer acrylics. That's my husband with one of our grandkids. That's for the Oko book. There's a watercolor. That's Great. Really, yeah. I love that one too. Oh, so that's fun. I did the um, I did a portrait in watercolor of the director of my art center. So you can see, uh, this is actually in, from the Boston area. This is where this is me and two friends from an old photo at the beach in um, we used Would to go I to Revere them? Beach, huh? Would I know them? No, I don't even remember their name. There's um, a watercolor of a woman I paint with. Another one. Another watercolor, my one of my cats. You, you enter, get the idea. That's one enter, of my grandkids. Hmm? Do you enter these into competitions or? Yeah, I do, and and then we sell them sometimes at the booth. Um, you, you sell the paintings or prints of your paintings. Work? Paintings. I've not wow. done. I, I mean, it would be intelligent, but I haven't done that. Made them into prints. So this one actually sold at a show. I called it Best Foot Forward. <laughs> that's really cool so yeah so i'm and this is hanging in my um second granddaughter's room lola's room that's a watercolor oh here's the one this is a funny story and then i'll let you go um i wanted to do one with texture you know when you paint with acrylic you can add stuff like gesso and other things to add a texture to it you know like the tacky paintings in mexican restaurants which i happen to love that have texture you know what i'm talking about yeah yeah so you yeah. can add texture with acrylic you can do it with a variety of things so i had been when i brush my cats i had been saving the fur in a bag because it's the easiest thing to do when you know i'm brushing i'm watching tv and i'm in a chair so i just stick it into a plastic bag so i had a bag full of cat fur and so i put the cat fur on the painting and then gessoed the cat fur in and then painted over it. So this is actually a woolly mammoth made with cat fur, which somebody actually bought. And I got more funny comments. People kept saying, where'd you get the cat fur? Was it when the cat parked it up? <laughs> Do you think the person who purchased it has a cat allergy? I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. And it's so funny what people say, you can't see the frame on this one, but I framed it in this great frame that had like, um, it was like textured wood, you know, it, it was like raw wood, like beech wood. Um, and so the frame was really cool because it had a lot of texture too. And what the woman said to me, people are so funny when you sell things at a booth. I mean, if I wrote down everything they said to me, it, it's like, oh my gosh, if they only knew they said that, what they sounded like. So the woman who bought this said to me, you know, I, I really like this painting. And one of the things I really like about it is the frame. And then the second thing she said, and also the price. <laughs> and it was like, wow, boy, does that make you feel terrific. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I've had a lot of fun with painting and maybe someday I will um, be able to illustrate, you know, one of my own books. Because, oh, is he, does he show the frame? No, you still can't see the frame on that one. Oh, yeah, that, there you. That's there another you. granddaughter, though. <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. Yeah. Oh, this one was the granddaughter that got me into my very first juried show. So that's kind of a good memory. And now I don't know how to get this off the screen. If I push I here. could I could stop the sharing. Okay, good. All right. So unless you have any more questions for me, I will no, let you awesome. go. I know you, I, you I, must be sick of sitting here. I, I would like to know the name of the book with the Newfoundland dog. Oh, that's the one called Sea Man, the dog who explored the West with Lewis and Clark. Sea Man, because my granddaughter just got that type of dog. She would be interested oh, in the story. She'd love that. 
This is arguably the most famous dog in American history because it's the only dog that is mentioned in every American history book or the expedition is mentioned in every American history um, book. And it is definitely the most famous Newfoundland dog of all times. Lord Byron also had a Newfoundland, by the way. And it was a Newfoundland dog who was the dog that um, in Wendy's nursery in Peter Pan. Oh, really? So J.M. Barry owned a Newfoundland dog. He did not own a St. Bernard. That was a Disney alteration of the story. Um, so J.M. Barry owned a Newfoundland dog when he was a little boy. And he wrote the dog Nana in the nursery, Wendy's nursery, to be a Newfoundland. So mm -hmm. just a little bit of trivia about Newfoundlands. Thank you. And this is the book's third cover, by the way. That's another little gimmick that publishers sometimes use to make a book keep, keep alive. They change the cover so it kind of looks like a new book and they can kind of jazz it up when they advertise it. Nice. Thank Very you so talented. much. For okay. I like, I like the title you titled it as a book tour. It was great. Oh, good. Good. Thank you. So I, it was a general tour of lots of things, but maybe it, that made it more something that everybody could grab onto, I hope. Anyway, this was a pleasure for me. I've enjoyed meeting all of you a little bit this way. <laughs> Wonderful seeing you again, and thank you so much. And thank you for getting me connected with the group, Judy. That was really terrific. What do you think of our adorable rabbit?